When you have your girls, you're never alone. You get together for coffee, maybe to work out, or just to laugh. We created Hey Girl, just for you. Can't wait for you to join us. Hey everybody, welcome to Hey Girl. I'm your girl Kim with an E and this is episode 98. Y'all, we're counting down to 100. And if you are just joining us, I want to let you know that Hey Girl is a safe space where you can share your experiences and be affirmed. Let's face it, life can be complex and sometimes overwhelming. That's why we believe in the power of conversation because knowing we're not alone is what will help us get through. And I'm so glad you're here with us today. I have a fantastic guest for you to meet. So go ahead and like and share this live. Go ahead and follow Hey Girl so you can catch all of our episodes and get ready for this conversation today. So y'all, as you may or may not know, this month we are spilling tea on all the things that our mothers never told us. So every week we are talking about those topics that we don't usually talk about. Maybe we're even uncomfortable talking about, but we're going there. So get ready. Now, as you come in, make sure that you say hello in the comments so we know you're here. And my question for you today is, what are some topics that you can say for sure you had to learn about on your own. Mom didn't give you a whole lot of information on that. Maybe it was about sex or your period or pregnancy, maybe breastfeeding. Hello, that is one that I must say I had to learn on my own. Okay, can we just go ahead and make it known that breastfeeding hurts? Okay, so I just helped all of you who haven't experienced it yet. It's a real thing, like it hurts and you know, when I was coming up and I was seeing women with their babies, it was just so sweet and so lovely to see the mother breastfeeding her baby. And then I had a baby and that happened and I was like, oh, hold on, <laughs> wait a minute. I wasn't prepared. So share with me in the comments, what kinds of things did you have to figure out? And uh, let's see if we can talk about that, right? So I mentioned that this is episode 98. So excited that we are two episodes away from the 100th episode. Can we get a hand clap for that? Yes. That's what I'm talking about. Man. I cannot believe that it has been 100 episodes since we started and my goodness, what a ride this has been. So of course we can't let a hundred episodes go without some kind of acknowledgement. And so what we're doing, first of all, you guys need to go to justkim.net and sign up for the Just Kim newsletter because those who sign up will be eligible to win a free copy of my book, Trust the Process. And what we're going to also be doing in the next month in April is actually going through the book with a small group of women. Now, I will not be going through the book with you. That's that's kind of awkward, right? I wrote it and then I'm like, they're guiding you through. But a, a group of women will be going through the book together week by week and, and sharing what they're getting from it. And um, And so then at the end of that time that you all are going through the book, I'll pop in and, and, and see what your feedback is. So that is really what will help me to know um, for future reference what works and what doesn't work. And I just really would love for you all to read the book and let me know what you get from it. And sometimes, again, as you know, doing things with others helps us get through so uh, if you are interested in joining that book club, definitely sign up for the newsletter and then I will be announcing the winner of that drawing at the end of this month. All right. Also, I need your help because as many of you may know, we also have a YouTube page, a YouTube channel. Some of you uh, are either not on Facebook often or maybe you have friends who are not. And I often tell you that you can go to our YouTube channel to watch past episodes of the show. Now, what I also need you guys to do though, is subscribe to the YouTube channel. Now we are putting content over there uh, that you receive here on Facebook and we will be 
building up the YouTube channel in the future, um, but we need to build that subscriber list. So guys, I need you just to not just pop over there from time to time, but also subscribe to the channel. And uh, that will help us in many ways to provide you with more great content. And of course, if you go to the YouTube, you'll be able to see some of those past episodes that you missed. You can share those links with friends who maybe are not on Facebook and building that subscriber list, as you may know, for content creators on YouTube is just everything. So just to recap, there are multiple ways that you can get your Hey Girl fix. Uh, the first way, though, is to go to the justkim.net. There you are able to sign up to the newsletter. You can also access the Hey Girl store from the website. And I will begin building back the blog. So some of you may have followed my blog uh, a few years ago called Books and Coffee. It has, of course, migrated over to the justkim.net website. And uh, I would love for you to take check out the blog post that I'm putting out as well. So lots of things going on. And I hope that you will be here for it, all of it. So who is here with me? Do we have anyone that has said hello yet in the comments? I am not. Oh, hey, Lisa. What's up? So glad you're here. So did you answer the question? What are some of the topics that you had to figure out on your own because mom didn't tell you? Can you share real quick one thing that you had to figure out? I'll give her a second to think about it. OK. While you're thinking, I want to introduce you to a very special guest. And I must say that I was, um, I think the, the, the way that I came across this guest was what inspired this month's, month's theme, <laughs> to be honest. And uh, I'll explain in a little bit why. Uh, my guest today is Micah Logan, AKA ML6. She is a native of Detroit, but moved to Huntsville in 2000 to attend Oakwood University. She majored in communications with an emphasis in print journalism and electronic media. Then two weeks after graduation in 2004, began working as a part-time news reporter at WEUP. For 16 years, Micah worked her way up to her current position as the assistant program director and music director for Worship 94.5 FM, the sister station to 103.1 WEUP. You can ride the midday shift with ML6 Monday through Friday from 10 to 2 on Worship 94.5. But Micah's story of survival began with a breast cancer diagnosis in May of 2013. And today... Her goal is to encourage young women who are faced with this disease. Her message to them is you may have cancer, but cancer does not have you. Fantastic. Here to inspire us all with her amazing story is Micah ML6 Logan. Hey, girl. Hey there. Welcome. Welcome. Oh, so Lisa answered my question. She said dating. She had to figure out dating on her own. What are what's one of those things you had to figure out on your own, Micah? Besides what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna get into the heavy stuff, but like, was there something that you kind of had to figure out when you grow up grew up that mom never told you? Uh I think probably dating things I maneuvered on my own. Um, I, talk mm -hmm. about, I talk more to my dad, though, about those things. Ah, uh, um, I grew yeah. up in a house of, you weren't, you, I was supposed to start my period until I was like 30. And then when it uh. came at like 13, 14, I was like, what is this? <laughs> what? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was actually after, it was at church, right before AY, I was cramping really bad. And then the oh. next morning, they wanted me to like start Pathfinders. And I was like, I'm not starting nothing because apparently I'm starting this. And, <laughs> um, right. I just remember the pad being like, it went from like the top of my chest to the back yeah. of my back. And I yes. was like, what is this? And then I went to school and my older sister, so to speak, they threw me like a welcome to women who are type party and they welcomed um. me to the path. My mom was just like, here. Like, uh, we, we so I think dating, the cycle stuff, I just yeah. had 
I maneuver that on my own for the most part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I totally get it. I know some women who said their mom gave them a book and a box of pads. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah, that was it. No, I didn't get a book. I just had that big old pad. I was like, what in the world? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> what is this diaper? Like, what am I do with this? <laughs> right. I know. That's so funny though. Like it's the uncomfortable topics that are just hard to to, to I guess talk about oh, with your you know, my mom could talk about it. She I she used to do seminars. Her, her, she and my dad, they used to do sex seminars, drug and alcohol seminars, all that stuff. And I think they felt because I was with them all the time mm -hmm. that I had a conversation. And Got you. Know, I was very aware and I picked up on a lot of things. Like, you told mm -hmm. me I wasn't supposed to start my period until I was 30. And here I am, all 12. <laughs> like, hey, what is this? What so, is going on? Right. So even yeah. even though I was hearing information, I wasn't connecting like, yo, mm -hmm. you're a and mm -hmm. so again, my dad and I, my dad would go get my pads. My dad would go and if I was cramping so bad, he got to come get me from school and bring yeah. me home, put my feet mm -hmm. in my water, crush up my pills and bring me tea. Aww. That man was so happy when I got on birth control because it regulated my cycle. <laughs> He was just like, I don't even let this girl get my job. Right. I gave him a break. That is so funny. Yeah. 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 That's such a sweet one. Yeah. 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 Uh, honey, those cramps were no joke. Listen, I had I had that. Still. Oh man. Yeah. And I it, had my yeah. period. I had my period for seven years. And then after I got off my chemo drugs. I was supposed to stay on those for 10, but then I took myself off of them with the permission of my, my, my doctors. And a couple of months after I got off of them, they told me I wasn't getting my period back. Uh, <laughs> that joke is that, back. And so with much a vengeance. In, seven, in seven years, I literally remember sitting on the floor in Target on the phone with my homegirl, like, what are all these new products? Like, what? Oh, wow. So that was like, I yeah. had to literally, and I'm still relearning, reteaching myself just certain things. Like now I'm on all a yeah. product. products. I had to get a prescription mm -hmm. for my doctor for my cramps. I know now, like, just certain, since I'm a little bit older, what I have to do to kind of prove it. It's like, yo, this is so ghetto and childish. Like, why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> So I want to get to all the things that you've dealt with since uh, since the diagnosis. But first, I want to talk about so I want to talk about your relationship with your mom. You mentioned that you, your dad was kind of the one that was there for you and you're going through some of the things. But what is your relationship? How would you characterize your relationship with your mom? And and I'm talking in particular growing up and prior to the diagnosis. Um, I was my mom's reminder to keep going i was my mom's um her visionary my, i was my mom's protector I was, this is before the diagnosis mm -hmm. okay i was i was my mom's just she would look at me and I was what drove her to do more, to be more, to make mm. sure, um, like, I was her push. Like, she mm. had me 24, and okay. it was a weird time in her life, and mm -hmm. she was finishing school, and she went away for, like, eight months, and showed up mm. eight months pregnant at my grandmother's mm. doorstep, like, Hey, hi. <laughs> and, um, you know, being raised in the church, that was yeah. not acceptable, especially back then, 1982. Like, no. So my grandmother kept her in the house. And then um she had me. Nobody in my family really knew that I was even a mm. thing. Um, she mm -hmm. had a choice to give me up for adoption. Um, and she was about to do it, but I got sick. And mm. me Sick, what is really what was like, no, I need to keep my baby. And mm. from there, it was just like, okay, now we got to tell the family. And then I became mm. everything 
And mm -hmm. as for I, you know, I've been the one to take care of a lot of people. Mm. My grandmother down to her last breath. I was her caregiver. Mm. So having mm. me shifted a lot of things in my mom's life. She was like, okay, I'm now going to do this again. And she didn't do it again until 18 years later. So she had my sister. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so, but my, I saw my mother create a business from the ground up. I saw mm. my mother raise me the best that she could. I saw her, you know, reach out to family, but I also saw her have her moments where she was like, this is my child, my responsibility. I got to do it, make it happen. I remember there were moments where, you know, we were eating breakfast for dinner and in my mind, I'm like, yo, this is great. Not realizing that at the time, breakfast was the, you know, least expensive to get. Or there was a time oh. where we had, and we were just kind of like, you know, with candles and stuff. I'm like, yo, we camping at night. You know, as I got older, yeah. I realized the things that my mom sacrificed. Because mm. Great family. Her parents were in Detroit. But she was like, Mike is my responsibility. But then my grandfather yeah. said, so, I don't care what you do, but you don't have my grandbaby in the dark. <laughs> and was like, time, but I watched yeah. my mom work. I watched her get mm -hmm. two PhDs. You know, finish her mm. master's. Get these start a successful business and I, I've just seen so much so I've literally mm -hmm. been we've been each other's source now yeah we've had our mother daughter issues for sure I went to boarding mm -hmm. school at 15 I left home at 15 and I never went back because I went straight to college and then life started happening so mm -hmm. there was a period where I had to sit my parents down like hey I'm not 15 anymore y'all gotta talk mm -hmm. to the rest of me because that was the last time you saw me. So we had yeah. our moment. We do know that we work better apart. Um, mm. Even now, but we talk every day. We start our days off with prayer. Every day, my mother and I talk. No matter what, we have prayer. Um, I make sure she's eating, make sure she's taking care of herself. And since my father's passed, I've been making sure that she is getting to know who she is now as a single mm. woman. No children mm. in the house that just embracing yeah. who she is because I've embraced who I am as a single woman. I go to concert by myself, I go out to eat by myself, I do whatever yeah. if I do it, I'm gonna do it. And getting her to understand that there is a freedom in that. Yeah. And knowing who you are without being connected to all these different things, just being Kim. So that's yeah my mom to each other. Yeah, I love that her name, her name is Kim, too. So she's awesome. <laughs> she's got to be an awesome person. Um, so it sounds like you and your mom have almost like a partnership. And, and, and you, have helped, you have probably taught her as much as she has taught you or, or uh, close to it. Yeah, in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's so interesting. So give me some sense of what your life was like just prior to... The diagnosis like what were you doing what were you what were your plans what was your vision for your life prior to that i i was living i was you know 20 something oh and i was diagnosed at 31 so i just turned third no i was 31 yeah just turning 31 when they diagnosed me so prior to i was good i just i remember Couple of weekends before my diagnosis, I had just signed at Oakwood for alumni. I was just kind of living my life. But here's the crazy thing: I always knew that something health-wise was going to happen to me after I turned thirty. And it wasn't really bad over myself. It was something that I knew, like when I was a teenager, I was like, when I reach thirty, something health-wise is going to happen to me. I know it, and I was, it was huh. very clear to me. Um, and so when I was diagnosed, though I was extremely shocked because I knew nothing about cancer, I yeah. wasn't shocked at the fact because I had a feeling that something health wise was going to go down with me and transpire with me. But prior to that, I was just living my life, I was in a relationship with some dude I had no business being in a relationship with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and right now we're best friends and all of that, but we just realized that we were better off as best friends. But it was just doing a time. It was just a crazy, you know, just living, you know, not really realizing the yeah. situation. 
toxic until I got out of it. Like, hey, whoa. whoa. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, love him dearly now, but we just knew that we weren't good in a relationship. He had way too much yeah. going on. I wanted different things. It just wasn't going to yeah. happen. Um, so yeah. That's really what I was doing prior to just living. Yeah. And looking forward to my 30s and trying to figure out, okay, how is this going to pan out? I had already had a major blow when my Uncle Jim had passed away a couple of years prior to. Um, he was mm -hmm. So that was a major blow to me. And he was a just, what? He was a chaplain at Oakwood um, University oh. before he passed okay. away. And so what, who that was, was that? Like, who was that, Michael? James, James Humphreys. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that happened. Um, that knocked the wind out of me. So I was just kind of still recovering, so to speak, from that because we were like this, and mm. so really feeling kind of lost without him. Because I mean, he's been my guy since I was 1982. Like we, we yeah. Um, not really knowing what was to come. In my yeah. And a lot. Oh man. A lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So talk about what okay, first of all, can we back up? You had a feeling that you were gonna have to deal with something health wise mm -hmm. and in your 30s. Like can you can you break that down a little bit? Like what do you mean you had a feeling? It was just <laughs> well <laughs> oh, when, no. I was, when I was younger, um I, I've always had a sense of like discernment or not like mm. seeing the future, so to speak, but mm. I threw things and it happened. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I remember, you know, my mom and I were coming home from an event that she was emceeing. It was late at night. And I, as we pulled up to our apartment, I said, Mom, don't get off the car. And she was like, mm. What are you talking about? Mommy, don't get off the car. She said, Girl, it's late. I'm tired. You need to go to bed. You got school tomorrow. We're getting out this car. And I was like, Mom, don't get out the car. She said, Girl, what? You're getting out the car. And as we got out the car, these two men came out of nowhere and attacked us. And one of them grabbed me um, to try to take me. And I'm screaming, I'm yelling, da 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 da. And when they grabbed me to take me, my mom went into like survival mode and she put the brakes off that man. And they ran off with our stuff. But ever since then, it was like, so when I speak, Wow. Because the night before, a couple of nights before, I had a dream that something was going to happen to us. Wow. Fast so, forward to me, you know, in my teens, I just had this feeling like, I know when I turn 30, something's going to happen. Like I said, oh, it wasn't wow. me feeling ill of myself. It was just yeah. something that God literally, I feel, was preparing me for. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I've heard people say things like that, people who have experienced that. And, and of course, I follow Tabitha Brown and she talks about mm -hmm. this this sixth sense, basically, which she's been given. Uh, yeah. That sounds very similar to yours. So then talk to us about when it finally happened and how it came about. I had been going to the doctor because I was having issues with my cycle. Like, mm -hmm. I'm on the pill, but it's not giving me three days. I needed to give mm -hmm. me three days. <laughs> so we were looking to determine dosage. And that mm -hmm. ran into annual, which I was very, I'm very serious about every year getting checked. And so I'm at my annual, and you know, now, I don't know, you, you seem like you're real, like, Matter of fact, I'm about to But for those of us, when we sit on the table and they say, Hey, are you doing your brush check? It's like, you don't really want to say no because you don't want to like come across as you're not doing what you're supposed to do. But the answer is no because you're really not doing those brush checks. So I was like, Yeah. I mean, when I remember, that was really. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. She's around, but she's giving me something's not right. And then she called the, the, the doctor in and they did another feel and they were like, yo, we're not comfortable with this. And they were like, we need you to go see a breast doctor for a mammogram. And at the time, I didn't even know how to spell mammogram. Like, oh, wow. 
wasn't something in my vocabulary to the point where mm. I left all the information at the at my OBGYN. They had to call me the next day and was like, hey, don't forget about your appointment. And then mm. from there, it just started like all of these doctor's appointments. And I honestly didn't think this was going to be a thing. Even though mm. I knew that I had health problems, I wasn't thinking this. This was it. Yeah. So the doctor calls me, you know, I go through the breast thing, then I have a biopsy and I have a week weekend and then they call me at work. And I'm answering the phone, I'm on air, you know, one of the women we up, da 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 and I'm on air mm -hmm. like, oh, God. and then she tells me and I'm just like, Ooh, like yeah. But like, everything just shut down. Mind you, yeah. I'm still, so I still have to communicate to my listening audience as if nothing's wrong. And I mm -hmm. did this in my day. Um, I immediately called my pastor at the time. And he was like, you got to call your parents. And I was like, I don't want to call my parents. Mm. I, just don't, I had already been through so much other stuff in our family. And so I just mm. was like, I don't want to put this on them. He was like, you got to call your parents. And so yeah. I did it. And they were ready. Like, my mom just started screaming. My dad got the phone. They were like, we're on our way. Mind you, they're all the way in Detroit. Mm. And I was like, I don't know, whole pack. My RNA was in Huntsville at the time, and my grandmother, she was living at the time, so she was there. Cousin Austin, Jared, they just, I was like, let them take care of it, and then we'll we'll figure it out. So that was kind of mm -hmm. how they did Like, I just went to my annual. So within a year's time, I mm -hmm. had two more growing in me, like, that was growing fast. So it sounded at stage two, but it was entering into stage three. Like, mm. It's my annual, it would have been all that. That's why I encourage oh. women, don't miss those annuals. Please go to the yeah. because so much can happen from year to year. And while you over yeah. here talking about, oh, I'm going to cancel, I'm going to cancel, I'm going to cancel. No, nah, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't cancel those appointments. Like, yeah. after that, once a year. It's so yeah. anything to be going on. Just can't take for granted that it's going to be like it always is. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, emotionally, how do you, what do you, how do you process that kind of news? And, and, and like, I know at some point you got to just, okay, now what's the next thing? But like the, the impact of that news, like you said, you were at work, you got to figure out how to get through the day. But then like when it, when you're able to kind of process, like what, what was that like? It was difficult because of course my mom wanted to tell the whole church and I was like, please, I don't need I'm the type of person where I just, I'm not, I don't need to just jump on the internet and request prayers. And what I like to yeah. let God lead me in that way. And when God gives me permission, to yeah. speak, because I feel like it's important and imperative for you and God to have conversations before you try mm -hmm. to get out there and tell the world. I understand power of prayer and all of that, but yeah. I needed to have, me and God needed to have an understanding of what was going mm -hmm. on and how we were going to get through this together. Because when it came mm -hmm. down to it, it wasn't about me and all the church mothers. It was about me and him. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I told my mom I needed to share it my way. i never forget. Mm -hmm. In the doctor's office, I'm in a group chat with some of my, my closest friends. We've been friends since we were babies, like 40 mm -hmm. years and everybody's like, yo, what's up? How y'all doing today? Da, 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 da. And I'm just in there talking like, hey, I'm good. Just found out I had cancer. Da, 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 da. Like, that's how I told them. And they were like, mm -hmm. run that back. Of course, they started mm -hmm. answering. And I was like, I don't really feel like talking right now. I'll holler at y'all another time. And I had to really take a moment to feel everything that I needed to feel honestly and genuinely. Because see, this is what happens. Oftentimes, we try to be so Christian that we act like mm -hmm. we can't be mad, angry, upset, disappointed, confused. Like we have emotions mm -hmm. to have. The thing about it is mm -hmm. we aren't supposed to let emotions have us. So mm -hmm. it's not a sin for us. It's not a sin for us to be like, yo, God, really was it? I'm going through the roller that's like, yo, who did I do wrong? What did I do to deserve <laughs> this? And then mm -hmm. God reminded me. You asked for three three things at the beginning of that specific year. I did. I asked for three specific things. I asked God to help me to appreciate my job more. 
helped me to be more active in the community and to increase my faith. And the irony mm. of the situation was that God answered all three of those prayers through the breast cancer diagnosis. And wow. so uh, when we go to God and request things, we got to be open that it may not come the way that it's supposed uh. to. And even when it comes, you might not necessarily like it. But right. you go and you be honest about how you feel. When I was mad, hurt, all that stuff, I was just like, yo, my God, mm. my right. God, that's really good. How are we doing this? Like, I right. You were I, like, I talked to him like he the homie. Like, yeah. what's up? Did you say and why me? Huh? <laughs> Did you ask why me? Why sure. why do I have to do this? Yeah. I'm like, why me? Like, what have I done in my past that was so bad? And then got yeah. God together, like, this is not about you. Wow. This yeah. Is for you to help somebody else. And what mm. I realized is that I have a unique way of expressing my diagnosis and the things that I've gone through in such mm -hmm. a real way that mm -hmm. I didn't have that for myself. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm looking, I'm researching, mm -hmm. you know, it was like one or two young ladies on the internet at the time, because young women weren't, aren't supposed to have breast cancer. You know, I'm supposed to get mm -hmm. that after, right? So, mm -hmm. though, this is where it wasn't talked about. It's talked about way more now, but still not enough, because even in ads, it's Oh, 45 plus. Well, if I would have waited to 45, I wouldn't have even made it to 32. So what do you tell yeah. me? Yeah. So I, you know, I had to process a whole lot and figure out who I was in the moment. And once I decided to live, I remember um, one of my, my god aunt, she called me, Janice Vanderhorst, and she was like, I need you to get it together. What you're not about to do is sit in this room. You're not going to suck. You got things to do, you got something to fight, and you got to live. And I was like, well, dang, I can't be like, I just found out a couple of days ago. But <laughs> she talked to me in a way in which that reached me. And she still mm. allowed me to feel. She just told me, mm. you can't sit in this. You got to mm. fight this. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. I went to work every single day. I... Went to baby showers, birthdays. I went on a family mm -hmm. trip. I had to be double dosed with the chemo, but I was determined to live. Now I might be sleep mm. at the back of the baby shower. I might be sleep at the table at the the birthday party. I might have to leave early, but I was determined to show up and be present mm. and celebrate. Mm -hmm. what? Because yeah. I didn't know because at the time they didn't even understand why I was even how I was diagnosed. Nothing. I took every gene test. It was just like, mm. and so my doctors were crying. They were confused. And I just was like, yo, we're not going to walk through this journey confused. We're going to be real clear that God going to do whatever he's going to do. And we're going to get through this thing together. And that's really mm. what happened. Like, after mm. I got my oncologist, he, he retired. He was like, I'm ending on a good note. I'm done. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's a good way that, to end yeah that was his way he, because he really he saw he's like i don't know and he said he said i don't know that much about this god that you serve but mm. whoever he is whatever he is medically i've never seen anything like this and wow. so for me i was like okay if my if it was for me to carry so that he could see god differently then i'm okay with that Wow, that's so powerful. God is going to use you differently than you can expect, than you, than you expect it. And you got to be aware yeah. of that. Because again, it's yeah. not like, I'm so conceited thinking that everything is about us. Wow. Not about you. Okay, yeah, get over yourself. Because it's not about you all the time. This is not. Mm. Yeah, God that's a word. You got to think, okay, not everybody can be a pastor. Not everybody can be a deacon. Not everybody can be an elder. Not everybody can be in Dorcas. Not everybody can do all those things. Your ministry literally is your everyday life. Your everyday mm -hmm. life. No matter what you do. Nobody should have to walk around here with a sign on their back or sign on their chest. Number, I'm a Christian. I'm a lover of God. It should literally come out in who you are. No matter what. Yeah. And so if, if who I was in that moment was a breast cancer like warrior 
then that means mm. that I'm a breast cancer warrior and I'm going to do it in the name of God. Mm. That's, just what's That's gonna awesome. That means that when I go to the doctor, every time I walk in there, I will go in there happy, talking to the mm. nurses. And I wouldn't be a fake. That's literally how I felt because I'm like, yo, I can't go in here. It's already like, a, like you're looking at death everywhere. Yeah. I got to go mm -hmm. in here and my life and allow my light and my little ball head to be a joy to somebody else that's in here who has it worse than me. Mm -hmm. That was my mm -hmm. the whole process. So what did the fight look like or what did it involve? So you, you were diagnosed at 31 and then you started chemo. What what was the what was the path forward and what were the doctors saying? Did they did they feel like this was something you could fight or were they were they pessimistic? They didn't know like they felt that I could fight it. They just didn't know if I was gonna have to do a double mastectomy or a lumpectomy. Mm -hmm. I think that was the biggest thing. And mm -hmm. they were like, we'll wait to the halfway mark to determine what's happening. And I was like, okay, well then we'll wait to the halfway mark. And I remember she had me on these herbs, she cleaned out my pantry, <laughs> she did all of mm -hmm. this stuff. And the halfway mark, my tumor actually did shrink in half. And so from that, they realized, okay, it hadn't metastasized, it hadn't gotten into any of my lymph nodes. It was really just in one place. They were like, okay, she's just going to have to have one back to me, but we still got to get it smaller. And I was okay with that. They were literally winging it with me as they went because they, I was young, I was healthy. They were like, we don't know what's going on here. I was there walking kind of exclusively for the most part. And so I got diagnosed in May, the end of May. June 6th was my first chemo treatment. I had 18 weeks of chemo treatments. Mm -hmm. And then October, the end, like around October is when I had my lumpectomy. And mm -hmm. then after the lumpectomy, I'm like, oh, I'm good. They're like, no, you got radiation. And then I had mm -hmm. 37 consecutive treatments of radiation. And that ended in January of 2014. Then in mm -hmm. August, I might have been July of, of 20, 2014. They went back, I went back for a checkup and they were like, oh, wait, we think it might be back. And I was like, mm. what? And I was like, I'm not saying nothing to nobody. But I had to tell my parents because I had to go back under anesthesia. And then mm. I remember I had, I had my friend Bruce, Bruce B. I was like, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? I was like, can you run me somewhere? And he was like, yeah, I got you. He didn't ask me no questions. We pulled up to the hospital and he was like, why are you here? And I was like, oh, yeah, they think my parents are back, so I got to have another surgery. To this day, literally, like this week, he's still extremely angry with me for not telling him. Me too. Oh, he's angry. <laughs> like, if you mention it, he will go clean off. Like, you have somebody take you to the hospital, you don't tell them why. He's like, who's going to stay with you? Who's taking you on? It was just all these things. Right. But again, I didn't, because I saw so many of my friends get closer to God through my walk, I didn't want to, I didn't want their faith to wait. Mm. I, I was carrying it. And again, it really wasn't mine to carry because it really all belongs to God. But I just felt like I didn't want to be a disappointment if it was. Mm. And so I was like, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. We'll come to find out. It was just some scar tissue. They had to be, you know, better safe than sorry. But yeah, mm. it was just like, it was everything was boom, 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 boom. Everything happened yeah. and not. It was so yeah. fast. It was so fast. Wow. So what I want to know, I've, I've always wanted to ask this to of someone, and it was never, I was never able to, so I'm going to ask you. What okay. does the chemo, when I hear about chemo and radiation, what does that involve? And, and then, like, when you go for the treatment, what, is, what do they do? And then what are some of the things that you deal with after those treatments in terms of symptoms or... Un, you know, discomfort yeah. and things like that. So, so you go in and you sit for three to four hours and you get in this cocktail, whatever cocktail that your oncologist and breast doctor come up with that's best for your specific body. Um, it's literally dripping into your veins. So what chemo does is it kills all good and bad cells in your body. And so the next day after that, you go back in to get the shot to boost your white blood cells. Well, that mm. shot 
had you would have you feeling like you were fighting three boxers at night because mm. it would put you in so much pain. And then to help with the pain, I was popping Zyrtex pills. It's something in Zyrtex that is supposed mm. to help you with the pain. Well, coming to find out, they were giving me too much of a dosage because I was, shouldn't have been in that much pain. I'm thinking, mm. I'm going to figure that out. And they're like, no way to say anything. It's not going to be that painful. I mean, it was like I had Holyfield, Mayweather, Joe Lewis, all of them just going boom, 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 boom on my body. Um, so that's really what chemo does. And you have, everybody has different treatments. Like, my nails didn't turn black. My toenails didn't turn black. However, I got thrash in my mouth. Um... I lost my eyebrows and eyelashes. They're so my eyelashes are slowly coming back. My eyebrows mm. are none. I literally had to put these on today. Um, mm. But I'm okay with not wearing eyebrows because I understand what I had to go through the year. So eyebrows are not going to Yeah. You lose hair. Now let me say something. You lose hair everywhere. Oh. Everywhere. everywhere. So I had shaved right before my first treatment, right? And I was like, what? Am I not having a shave? I was trying to say it. Oh. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> now that's something we never think about. What we see the hair go away here. Wow. No way. Wow. No underarm hair. Like nothing. And I was like, okay, we can do this. <laughs> Okay, if there's something positive that comes out of this, okay. I, like, I had to, I had to find something. Positive. My hair fell out, and that first time under the shower, and that water hit, baby. I was like, oh, this is what it feels like. <laughs> oh, this is this is life. So I just wow. Trying to embrace what could have been looked at as bad. Oh, am I now yeah. being black? Okay, let me let my nail tech know what I'm going through. We can use some stuff. I kept my nails done. I made sure mm. I had few accessories, few accessories. I did not wear a wig. It was hot mm. down there. All the time. I wasn't doing it. I wore my mm. ball head. I let it shine. And I just, I walked it. Yeah. I, I literally walked. That was my choice to walk it. And, and, and yeah. it was hot. So you have that confidence too. Like I feel like you probably always had that anyway. Um, I don't know. I think at growing up, you know, younger, um, of course, you know, you're dealing. You, I dealt with colorism, but not to the extent where it made me hate me. It made me be like, oh, I look different. But I never forget, my mom was hosting something, and actress Kim Fields was there, and I remember being really sad. And I remember her taking me to the side, and I, the basis of the conversation was, you're beautiful no matter what shade you are, basically. That's basically what she was saying. Mm -hmm. She kind of affirmed me at like six or seven. I was right that. Mm -hmm. From that, I just never... I was who I am. Like I didn't yeah. really trip. Like it was just it right. Was what it um, but when that's, you go through that, when you go through yeah. that, you walking around here with bare face and really just out here, and okay, this is who I am. And then I had my father. My daddy was super affirming. Like mm -hmm. when, I, when my hair started falling out, he was just okay, baby. Don't watch it fall out. You go to the barbershop and you get your hair cut. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. you're going to be my little chocolate drop. Like, that's just kind of my dad yeah. literally affirmed me. It was hard for my mom to grasp what was going mm -hmm. on. She was internalizing everything, and this was something she couldn't fix. She yeah. couldn't fix it better. So, watching me go through it was difficult for her. And sometimes yeah. she would like try to act like I wasn't going through it because it was just hard for her to acknowledge it. And yeah. I understood that. I under I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna give her grace because I'm her child. And it's hard mm -hmm. for her to see her child suffer and she literally can't do anything but buy me a bag to say, Yeah, here you go. This is all I can do. Yeah. Mommy, I don't need no yeah. bag, okay? So it yeah. was, it was Whereas my dad, he took on the ranks of 
let me be the voice in her ear as a man to affirm my baby. He did that. Yeah. He did it. He did it very well. So do you feel that that going through this process of, of just hard, hard things, and, and, and I know you, you had loved ones and your dad who, who also helped to get you through it and to bolster you as you've already described. Do you feel that also just by virtue of going through it, it made you stronger and gave you even more confidence and, and sense of self? For sure. Um, you learn to not sweat small stuff. You learn yeah. to be like, yo, that, that really ain't worth me getting mad over. Like, cause this is yeah. really gone in a minute. Like, yeah, I'm sure it clarifies so much. Yeah, mm -hmm. Black women, though we may get it, like on the, the, the low end, we die from it on the high end. So the survival weight of black women breast cancer is low. And mm. so I've been able to get through that in and, and nine months and then not go into my living rooms and then not take over and not have to do the double. All of that was just God's blessing and favor, even in the midst of what was going on. And so mm -hmm. there is a level of confidence that comes with that, with God's faith. Mm -hmm. I thank God yeah. for what happened to me. Yeah. I thanked him. I thanked yeah. him. And to this day, I still mm -hmm. thank him because it literally, like, yo, like, you really tripping over that and you had chemo and you had cancer. Yeah. Like, yo, like, yeah. it ain't, it, it reels me back in for the yeah. small stuff. Yeah. I mean, we should all be thinking of the things that we complain about and <laughs> Rethink that because it, you know when you go through right. something like that, it's like your priorities <laughs> become real clear, and what matters mm -hmm. and what doesn't matter exactly. becomes real clear. So what what I found to be the most unique in your story was not just all that you've described, which is of course <laughs> completely amazing, but then the flip where you get a phone call from your mom who says mm -hmm. what. She's like, I've been to the doctor because I was on her about going to get her mammogram. I was on her, on, on, on her. And I never forget, I was sitting at the nail shop on University in Pulaski. And uh, she said, I have stage one breast cancer. And I just. Lord I God. After my dad passed, after my grandmother passed, it was my grandmother, my aunt, and then my dad. I was tired. I was exhausted mm. with everything. And I said, I told God, I said, I need you to do me a favor. All right, I get mm. you got to have, but can you please not let her have to go through everything that I went through? Please mm. do me a favor. And I was so So, excited. Micah, hmm? how, how long after your your completion of treatments and, and getting the, the all clear from your doctor. How long had, how what time period had passed since since your experience? My mom was diagnosed in 2017. I got cleared in 2014. Okay, so three okay. years. Yeah, but in between that time, you've had all these other losses. So it I was just, all, it was just like one thing after another. Yeah, I was like, I was dealing with heavy, heavy survivors and wars. It was hitting me like a lot. And I like, I can't take no more. So I was like, God, just please give me this salad. And he answered me. My mom didn't have to go through chemo. She had to have radiation and surgery. And that was enough in itself. But what mm. it did was all the things that my mom didn't understand when I was going through my process mm. to a lot of things. And she apologized. Mm -hmm. I have to apologize, but I was grateful that she did, and I accepted it. Because sometimes mm -hmm. we're real quick to judge somebody, but then we don't really know until yeah. we walk the walk. And yeah. so, as much as I hated that she had to walk that, and you know, she yeah. was doing her medication like that, to a, for us, it was just like okay, it was a bonding moment in itself. Yeah, right. It was a bonding moment yeah. in itself. It was rare because for me to get it first, then she get it. And yeah. it's still not be in our gene test. Like it's still not yeah. Me. That's yeah, crazy. that's wild. My little, sister, my little sister just turned 22. So she has to start now getting her checks just in case because my mom and I both have gone through it as well. 
just, yeah. just offer just, just safety at this point because we don't know. Is she is it's she not afraid? Is she, yeah, is she nervous? Your little sister? I don't know if she's afraid, but I do know um, prior to me getting diagnosed, she would come and spend the summers with me. And that summer that I got diagnosed, my parents were like, well, we don't think that she should come. And I said, no, she needs to see this. She mm. needs to know that this is happening to her sister. She needs mm. to watch me over this so she can understand just in case. Mm. Mm. Like, we're not hiding this from her. We're not making it seem like yeah. this isn't our reality because it is our reality. Yeah. And I said, I'll do what I can for her. And what I can, I'll make sure I have a village in place to help me. And so that summer, she still came with me. And I did what I could. And my village stepped up to do the things that I could. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you saying is trusting God, face it, go through it, see yeah. it for what it is, deal with it. Yeah. And 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 you really, it's a, it's an acceptance of the reality. And and then and I think what's really important that you're saying too is that and and see it as something that's bigger than you. That there's yes. something that God is doing through this thing that yes. that may be beneficial to the others in your sphere of influence or who knows. And so we have to also trust that. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I my slogan is feel, deal, so that you can heal. Because if you don't do the first oh, two, good. you're definitely not yeah. going to do the last one. Not from a good right. place. Not from the right place. Yeah. Stop so walking around here thinking that you got to be blessed and highly favored. The Lord is good. Yeah. Da, 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 right. Da. Stop going out and faking that. Like, that ain't going to get you yeah. into the kingdom anymore. Like, by yeah. <laughs> it's just not. Right. Be, be real about it. Face it. Holler at God. Be straight up. So that he can really do the work that he's supposed to do. And that you can really yeah. get him that you're supposed to get. Wow. Well, that's a word. That's so good. So <laughs> thankfully, your mom had what well, if her diagnosis came earlier than yours. Was it mm -hmm. was she just on top of her her health care? Was she just doing what yeah, she needed to do? Or how did they were able to catch her so soon? I was on her about going to get her memory. I was just yeah. I was like, you're not yeah. gonna keep this appointment. You're gonna go. And so she mm -hmm. was like, and her going literally saved her life. Again, so, me being that yeah. voice. Go ahead. Just me being that voice for her. My mom may not yeah. listen to a lot of people, but there's a way that I can talk to my mom that I get her right together. <laughs> <laughs> And that goes back to your relationship that you described yeah, earlier on. You, you, mm -hmm. You're there for her. Yeah. So talk about, you said God through this diagnosis has allowed you to also uh, have a platform and, and to be a blessing and a witness to others. We actually have a few minutes left in the show. So I want you to, to talk a little bit about some of the things that you've done in the community, what message you're able to share with other women. And then what would you like to say to our audience of women that, that they really need to know um, and learn from your story? I think, you know, embracing who we are as women, I think now it's becoming more popular for us to, you know, embrace our curves, embrace our beauty, um, embrace everything that others may think is quirky about us to really look at ourselves every single day and be like, yo, I'm that chick. Even with my flow, even with, I don't get it right every day, I'm that chick. And I also understand that there is strength and understanding that we are weak. Like, we don't have to walk around mm -hmm. here being strong all the time. There is mm -hmm. more strength in recognizing, you know what? I can't take on the world today. I just can't do it. Yeah. Not, I have zero to prove. I have anything yeah. to prove by rushing getting better. I had to go through yeah. it however I was going to go through it. I had to, mm -hmm. however I was going to look going through it, that's just what was going to happen. So now what I've given a voice to is being comfortable in the skin that you're in going through the thing God has blessed you. Like, God trusted me to go through that. That when I got mm -hmm. on the other side of it, that I would be able to tell the story straight up. No yeah. answer, just straight, not on the rock. Just, this is what happened. Giving the glory and just really telling young women, yo, 
Y'all women get breast cancer too. Like it's not your grandma. It's not your auntie. Yeah. At the church, it's literally the young girl ringing up your groceries. It's the girl at the movie. Yeah. It's the mall. It's the stripper. You know what I'm saying? Like Murphy. it's all type, and you just never. Yeah. So when somebody walks into your church. When somebody walks down the street, you may not like what they have on. You might even not like what they say. You have no idea what they're going through. When I walked yeah. there, I thought that I went crazy. I would, I would jump off the deep end with cutting my hair. Like, oh, shoot, she gone too far now. And I realized that I was dealing with a whole disease. Right. So if you judge me based on the fact that I had purple hair here or yellow hair or green hair, da, 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 like, you don't know what's really going on with people. You got to be yeah. If that woman walks into the church and her skirt is short and her shirt is tight, don't judge that baby. You don't know what it took for that girl to get there. And that might have legit been all she had. And the fact that she yeah. that church, that should be the only thing that you focus on. Stop focus on judging that baby. What you do yeah. is find out her story and then you help yeah. mold her. Not change her, but you show her a different path. Yeah. You got to understand so important. Having, having a sensitivity to what you see. Because you don't know everything. Christians don't know everything. Adventists don't know everything. Like, we don't. Right. That's, right. not, that's not how we're supposed to be. Our responsibility is to be true to what God has told us to say and what God has told us to do. My dude wasn't walking through Jerusalem judging folks. He had on his, right. his, his robe and his sandals and he was handling his business and minding the business that God told him to do. That's the same thing we're supposed to do. Yep. The exact same thing we're supposed to do. So for me now, yep. I'm just really telling people, hey, young women, please do yourself checks. When you're in the shower, after your cycle, fill around. Nobody knows your body better than you. Know your mm -hmm. body. I don't know up in the church that used to make you feel like it was a sin to know your body. Know your body. Please know your body. Yeah. Body. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting that you would say that. Yeah. Feel it. Feel on that thing. Yep. To know that if yep. something don't feel right, you can be like, hey, I didn't feel this two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting that you would say that because we had Dr. Howell on last week and she was saying similar things. Like there's certain parts of our body we don't want to talk about. We don't want to look down there. We don't want to touch. We don't, you know, but, you know, it's your body. And, and <laughs> you know, let's let's just, just relax and, and, yeah, and do what we need okay. to do. Um, yeah, for sure. Like it's okay to take a mirror, put it under, look at it, <laughs> look at it. I mean, yeah. yeah. Because if there's something wrong, how else are you gonna know? Why you let your OB get all up in there? You don't know what your you don't know what your vagina look like. If you don't get to know what right. your vagina look like, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so it's so true. It's so true. I, I have loved this conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like we could probably talk for another hour about stuff. <laughs> I'm just gonna have to have you back. Okay. <laughs> So, um, but I thank you so much for, for sharing your story. I have just started um, following you on, on social media and I think you're just an inspiration and I'm so glad that you're allowing God to use you. And, and it's true that, that we need to share our stories, whatever, whatever that story might be, because you just have no idea how it might be a blessing to someone else and just really even free someone else from something that may be holding them hostage because I think they're the only one that's going through that or or that struggles in that way. And so I just I really appreciate your your realness, your honesty. Uh, as I told you, I was I was I was willing for you to go wherever you wanted to go in this conversation because it's it's necessary to just to just really be real about these things and, and absolutely the message to women about getting their annual checkups and, and paying attention to your body and what it's telling you. And then, and then of course, remembering that God is doing something in all of our lives. And so it's just, it's just a matter of not getting caught up in whatever we're dealing with, but know that he's working something out for our good and for his glory. So thank you for, for your story and sharing with us today. Guys, we are out of time. Thank you so much for being here with us and for listening to this amazing uh, testimony for, uh, that Micah has shared. And I hope that you were blessed by it. If, if you know someone who needs to hear this message, make sure that you share 
with uh, share the live, go back and watch the replay and share it with someone that you love. And, and let's remember that God is doing something in each of our lives and trust that regardless of how hard it might be. Our scripture for today is actually Micah's favorite scripture. And I think it's so appropriate. It is from Philippians four verses six and seven. And it says, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What I love most about this verse is the part that says the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. God will give you a peace and a mindset that it doesn't make sense to other people. They will not understand why you are smiling, why, why you are walking with your head held high, even though your hair is gone. And that is the peace that God will give you regardless of the hard things he may be bringing you through. So I hope that you were blessed and inspired by this story today. I know I was, and I hope that you will come back next week as we continue spilling the tea about all the things that our moms couldn't, wouldn't, were not able to tell us, and we had to learn for ourselves. Next week, we have my good friend, Darissa, who will be here to talk about parenting. Now, there's so much that we have to figure out on our own with that. I can't wait for you to meet her and for her to share with us. Until next time, guys, be blessed. Hey, girl. You know, moms are great, but there's some things we have to learn on our own. From our bodies to our money, this month is all about getting answers to the questions we never thought to ask. Join us Saturdays at 5 on Facebook Live.